Hello and welcome to this first session of the course Praying with the Gospel of John. Uh, we brothers are excited to be offering you this course of, uh, of reflection and study and prayer with the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has been extremely important in shaping our own spirituality, uh, the way that we try to live uh, with one another and for others in the world. So we're glad to be sharing with you uh, this, uh, this Gospel that has meant so much to us. We'll be meeting together for uh, eight sessions and uh, on Tuesday evenings, uh, we will present a teaching for about 45 minutes, uh, introduction to some theme in the Gospel of John. And then uh, uh, you will have, uh, following up uh, this meeting tonight, you'll receive an email with some suggestions for prayer for the coming week. So you can continue to pray with the theme that we have uh, begun on Tuesday evening. So uh, thank you for joining us. And I'd like us to pause here at the start for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Shed upon your church, O Lord, the brightness of your light, that we, being illumined by the teaching of your apostle and evangelist John, may so walk in the light of your truth, that at length we may attain to the fullness of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our focus tonight will be on the opening section of John's Gospel, the, which is commonly referred to as the prologue, it covers the first 18 verses of John chapter 1. So if you have a Bible handy and you want to keep it open before you as we talk about this uh, and occasionally refer to other places in the Gospel, um, I invite you to, uh, to get a Bible now and have that, have, have that with you for this session and for the remaining sessions. But before we begin to look at the prologue, I'd like to just say some things about John's gospel in general, some uh, understandings uh, that I would like you to have before we begin this work together. Each of the gospels is an individual portrayal of Jesus. Each of the gospel writers is writing from their own point of view, from their own set of experiences, from the stories and the sayings of Jesus that they have been able to collect or uh, pick up from other sources. And they have compiled this into their own testimony about Jesus, their own gospel or their own version of the good news. And so uh, it's not surprising that we get four slightly different accounts. Uh, if we were to ask uh, those of us who are taking this course all to take time to write out an outline even for our gospel that we would present the gospel according to David or the gospel according to Sue or to Mike, uh, uh, each of us would be drawing from our own experience, drawing from the stories and the words of Jesus that we heard that have impressed us the most, trying to create a coherent and uh, picture of who Jesus was and, and what he means to us. So we see some differences between the Gospels, and nowhere is a difference more marked than in John's Gospel. John's Gospel stands apart from the other three Gospels. In fact, the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are sometimes referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-C the same eye or a similar eye. These three Gospels present a similar picture to Jesus, often sharing the same stories and sometimes even the same wording, uh, copying parts of, uh, of one another's Gospels. And so these Gospels have a kind of unity. John's Gospel stands apart. It's a, it's a very unique work and the way that John orders his gospel and the, th the things he decides to talk about are very uh, peculiar to John. 
And so uh, sometimes uh, John's gospel has been seen as a more mystical gospel, but it certainly is a full and rich gospel. And uh, since it's the last one that was written, it uh, is the one that reflects uh, the deepest and most extensive uh, um, theology or Christology understanding about who Jesus was. Uh, so we have a gospel that is very unique. And John's gospel is basically, uh, we could say if it, if it boiled down to a central theme, the theme would be love. The community from which this gospel comes, which is referred to sometimes as the Johannine community, the community around uh, that was inspired by John, um, that community's uh, message is that God is love. And that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that those who believe on him uh, would have eternal life. That's the message of John's Gospel, that God is love. And out of God's love, God has sent Jesus into the world in order to provide a way of salvation for us. And uh, John's uh, emphasis is, is about love. Not only is God love and is God acted in love by sending Jesus into the world, but we are to be people of love. We are to love God as God has loved us. And we are to love one another in this Christian community. And so love is the message of John's gospel. It's the overriding theme of all that John wants to say. It's all about love, we could say. Uh, in John's Gospel. We are to be recipients of this love, uh, to enjoy this love, to live and abide in this love, but we're also to be ambassadors sent into the world ourselves to be agents of this love and communicators of this love to others. So we have good news to share uh, with other people about God's love and about uh, uh, love as being central to the purpose of human life. So uh, the gospel also, uh, in addition to having this overriding theme of love, the gospel comes from the eyewitness of specifically one of Jesus' disciples. And this disciple, uh, who has been referred to as John historically since about the second century, uh, this, this disciple is not named in the gospel itself. He's only referred to by the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this unknown disciple, this beloved disciple, this disciple whom Jesus loved, appears at several key points in the gospels. He's there at the Last Supper. In fact, he's leaning against the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, which is what this icon here depicts. This is the beloved disciple leaning on the breast of Jesus at the, at the Last Supper. He enjoys a special intimacy with Jesus. He is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He appears also at the, at the uh, arrest and the trial of Jesus, and then at the crucifixion. He is at the foot of the cross with a small handful of women who have remained faithful and who have seen Jesus uh, to his end right uh, by standing at the foot of the cross. He's also uh, present uh, uh, in the resurrection narratives, and he's among the disciples as Jesus reveals himself, the risen Jesus reveals himself. So this disciple whom Jesus loved, who is not given a name, uh, is the central eyewitness. And it's his account, it's his testimony as to who Jesus is that forms the, in the viewpoint of this gospel. So the gospel, if, it's, if he is not exactly the author, he may be the, literally the author of most of the gospel. But even if he's not, it's his testimony, it's his witness that has been gathered here in this gospel. And this gospel, being the last of the gospels, uh, is thought to have been written around the year 90. So if we think that Jesus died probably around the year 30, we have a period of 50 or 60 years in which uh, the Christian community is making sense of the life of Jesus 
remembering what he taught and how he lived and the things that he did and uh, putting together their understanding of who Jesus was. And so John's picture of Jesus is, is the product of this long period of reflection uh, by the Christian community as they come to understand who Jesus is. Um, so uh, the beloved disciples witness to Jesus himself and his theological reflection on who Jesus is are incorporated into this gospel that bears the name of John. Now remember too that this is a gospel and the Gospels, uh, we're, we're used to 21st century thinking and we're, we're used to having things documented and factual and provable and ordered and, and time and references and things. Uh, it's not the way that Gospels were written. So this is not a biography of Jesus. It's not an attempt to orderly set down the facts of Jesus' life one after another. This is a Gospel and a Gospel is a document that is written in order to convince, in order to uh, to provide proof. To and John admits in his gospel in John chapter twenty, verse uh, verse thirty and thirty one. Uh, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. So remember that, that this is the perspective, this is the goal of any gospel writer. They're writing the story, but in a way that they're trying to convince others that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. And so we worry less about, are these facts right? Is the order right? Did this happen first and second? And, and we look more for the message what is John trying to tell us about Jesus? How is he helping us come to see Jesus and to believe in Jesus, to put our trust in Jesus? That's what's important about uh, reading a gospel. Uh, and so we uh, will be looking at this gospel through those eyes. How does John uh, select events from the story of Jesus, select teachings from Jesus, and how does he weave them together into a message that's compelling to his readers and that helps them to believe in Jesus and put their trust in him. Now John's uh, gospel uh, can be um, broken down into, uh, into four sections. The first section is what is called the prologue. It's the first 18 verses of the first chapter of John. John begins with kind of a poetic uh, piece uh, with uh, different stanzas that, that speak about who Jesus is and give kind of a, uh, a picture of Jesus' divine origins. Uh, and the prologue is this section occurring right at the beginning of the gospel. It's almost as if John is going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to slide the curtain open for you and I'm going to let you see who Jesus is. This is who we understand Jesus to be. And then, and then we're going to turn to the story and we're going to watch people come in contact with Jesus, encounter Jesus, and watch as they try to figure out who Jesus is. But you, the reader, you already know because I'm revealing this to you in the, in the prologue, in the first section of the gospel. So you already know the secret of who Jesus is. But now we're going to watch others encountering Jesus throughout his lifetime and either coming to believe in Jesus or rejecting Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. Uh, we'll see different people interacting with him. Um, but we know from the start, from the prologue, who Jesus is. The second section is what is referred to as the Book of Signs. It begins in the 19th verse of the first chapter of John, and it carries through all the way to the end of chapter 12. And in this uh, section, we have uh, the miracles of Jesus and we have the teachings of Jesus. 
And John doesn't use the word miracles, unlike the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They talk about miracles. John prefers the word signs. These are signs. And he's carefully selected several of them. Like he said in John 20, verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. He hasn't got the time or the space to write down everything he knows about Jesus, but he's carefully selected several signs that show us who Jesus is, that point us toward the truth that Jesus is, uh, is bringing into the world and uh, the truth that Jesus is pointing to in his life and in his teaching. So John has carefully selected these signs and now will present them. And he includes not only the signs themselves, the miracles themselves, but also uh, usually an extensive discourse about what this means, uh, the kind of spiritual, the transcendent meaning of what has taken place in this miracle. John is not as concerned about the wonder of the miracle itself, right? Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, that's wonderful. It's amazing. But John is more concerned is what does that tell us? What does it show us? That's a sign for something. So we're not to be caught up just in the fact that Jesus can work miracles, but we're to, we're to be focused on what does this point to? What does it indicate? What does it reveal to us about who Jesus is and about who God is? So these are signs that John has carefully chosen, and we see him encountering different people uh, throughout this section of the gospel, performing these signs and uh, discoursing about the meaning of these signs. So there's his public ministry in chapters 1, 19 through the end of chapter 12. At chapter 12 and 13, we see a, a change. Uh, that's like the apex. We come to a point and we head in a different direction in chapter 13. Chapter 13 through 20 will be chapters describing Jesus' final days with his disciples. So the focus now is on those who have accepted Jesus' word and have believed in him his disciples. Jesus spends time giving them some final discourses and instructions. And this begins at chapter 13 with the story of the Last Supper. And then uh, after chapter 13, the Last Supper, we have chapters 14, 15, and 16, which are teachings that are given by Jesus to his disciples in this kind of intimate setting and in his final hours. In chapter 18, we read of his arrest in the garden and of his trials before the high priest and then before Pontius Pilate. And then in chapter 19, we read of his death by crucifixion and his burial. Chapter 20 includes uh, stories of the risen Christ, the, the risen Christ appearing to his disciples in Jerusalem first to Mary Magdalene, and then to his disciples gathered in an upper room without Thomas present, and then again with Thomas present. Those stories uh, taking place in Jerusalem uh, make up chapter 20. And so we have the final week of his life from the Last Supper through the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion, and uh, the resurrection uh, comprising this, this section of the gospel, which is referred to as the book of glory. Now that uh, term glory uh, has a particular meaning uh, because uh, in, in the Old Testament times, uh, God's glory was God's presence among the people. It was centered first in the tabernacle as they moved through the wilderness, and then later in the temple that was built in Jerusalem. That's where God dwelled. That's where God's glory abided. And so now we are reading about God taking on human form and revealing God's glory in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is on this path. The whole gospel has a kind of an arc to it, uh, a kind of a, a cycle. Uh, it begins uh, 
with Jesus' divine origins. In the beginning, uh, before all things were made, uh, the Word was with God and was God. And then in verse 14 of the prologue we read, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this Word, which was dwelling with God in the supernatural realm, um, takes on human form and comes and shares in our human existence. And then he, the ark continues and he gradually returns to God, completing the, the cycle. And he returns to God, not just through his resurrection and ascension, but through all of the events of this second half of the gospel, through his, uh, uh, through his arrest and trial, through the crucifixion. The crucifixion itself uh, in John's gospel is a moment of glory. God's glory is being revealed in the crucifixion as Jesus is lifted up from the earth so that all may see and believe in him. And so the crucifixion is part of his movement uh, back to God, the movement uh, to return to glory. Uh, the crucifixion, uh, the uh, resurrection, the ascension, uh, back to the Father, are all part of this movement. Of course, he's taking humanity with him into those divine places as he returns and elevating us uh, into, uh, into the divine realm. So we have uh, uh, this arc uh, through, and, uh, and then finally at the end of the Gospel, we have a fourth section, chapter 21, which seems to be an addition to the gospel that was added later and is often referred to as the epilogue. If you read to the end of chapter 20, you, you see the gospel coming to a natural conclusion where John says that these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I've selected these signs, written about them in order for you to believe. End of gospel. And then chapter 21 comes on and adds several more resurrection appearances. And these are resurrection appearances as opposed to those that are in chapter 20. Uh, those in chapter 20 take place in Jerusalem. These in chapter 21, Jesus appears to his disciples in Galilee. And he appears uh, uh, to Peter and the beloved disciple and the others as they're fishing in Galilee. So there's a, a second set of resurrection appearances um, that are added on that address some of the concerns of the Christian community. And so um, these four sections in the prologue is the introduction, the first view of who Jesus is. Second is the book of signs, Jesus' wondrous acts and their significance, what they point to. And then third, the Book of Glory, where we see Jesus moving through the last week of his life uh, into his death and resurrection and uh, eventually into his return to glory. And then finally, the last chapter added as an extra epilogue uh, containing a few extra um, resurrection appearances and addressing some of the concerns of the community, which we'll look at when we get to that point in the Gospel. So let's take a look now at the prologue of the Gospel, the very first section of those four sections. And you'll see the Gospel, uh, the prologue uh, is divided into uh, a number of almost like stanzas or verses where there's uh, something is revealed about uh, Jesus and uh, the, these various sections. In, in between these sections, there are some references to John the Baptist that are in sort of that kind of grounded into the historical reality. John is the one who has come to testify to the light. He himself is not the light. He's come to testify to the light. But these other verses talk about how the light is coming into the world in the person of Jesus. So we start with the very first verse, which opens up with the words, in the beginning. Now, if you were a Jew reading these words, you would think immediately of the story of creation. Because Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, begins with these same words, in the beginning, 
and God created the world. And you remember the story how God spoke things into existence in the creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It was God's word that called forth into existence all the things that came to be. And God said, let there be light, and then God said, let there be sun and moon, and let there be plants and animals, and let there be human beings, and he calls all things into existence by the word. Now, John ties back to that creative word of God as he begins his gospel. And he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now he's referring to the word, in Greek it's the word logos, the word. And that's how it's usually translated, and that's, that's an all right translation, it's an acceptable translation. But it really goes beyond just God's verbal words. It goes it goes, uh, it encompasses uh, God's design, God's plan, God's uh, vision. Uh, all of that is encompassed in the word, is what God was calling forth into existence at the time of creation. It's that the word was with God. So the word wasn't something that God created. It was with God from the beginning. And through the word, all things were made. So the, the word itself wasn't created, but it was the agent of, of creation. And uh, so this would be a direct link for, for Jewish people reading this to the Old Testament story of the creation. The word, John tells us, was with God and was God. So instead of starting out with Jesus' uh, earthly origins, his human origins, there's no story of Bethlehem here or of Mary and Joseph or shepherds and wise men. Instead of starting out with Jesus' earthly origins, John starts out with his divine origins and says Jesus uh, is the Word of God that existed with God from, from before all time. And uh, he says this Word was coming into the world as as light, as the, the metaphor is light penetrating darkness. And the darkness resists it, but it can't overcome it. The, the light is too strong, too powerful. It will eventually uh, win out over the forces of darkness. So we have this first section that tells us that uh, the, word, uh, the word existed with God the Word was the agent of God's creativity and of, of creation itself, and that the Word came into the world as light, offering light and life uh, to those who would believe. Uh, then we see in uh, verses, uh, there, there's an insert there about John the Baptist's role in this, and then we return to the, to the original theme by saying the word came into the world and some people rejected it and some people accepted it. So in verses, um, the verses 9 through 11, we have the rejection of the word. That the word came to us offering light and life, and yet there were people who preferred the darkness because their works were evil and would not come to the light. So there was resistance to this word. There was, there was pushback, there was rejection of it by some people. And the first half of John's Gospel, the Book of Signs, is about this light coming into the world. And we see the opposition, the resistance building throughout the first section of the Gospel, the first half of the Gospel, until it climaxes with Jesus' miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, after which his opponents decide to put him to death. So we have a growing resistance. Uh, John acknowledges that there's this resistance to the light coming into the darkness, that some prefer darkness over light. But he also says some were able to accept this word and came to see and believe in Jesus. And those who did found everlasting life. Their light and life came into their lives. They experienced uh, the, uh, the beginnings of uh, eternal life in, in their own day-to-day -day existence. 
And so he says, those who have accepted it receive power to become the children of God and to enter into a relationship of love and intimacy with God as God's own children. They have uh, belonged to God and they have discovered in this a new identity, a new way of thinking of themselves. They are children of God, a new way of being in the world, a new purpose for living in the world. Uh, this divine life has become theirs. And so we have both rejection and acceptance. Uh, indicated already in the prologue, setting up a tension that we'll see played out again and again and again through the gospel. Finally, uh, John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this word that existed with God and that shared in the divine nature of God became human being in the person of Jesus and dwelt among us. Now there again, uh, Jewish readers, their ears were perk up because they remember how God has dwelt among them. Uh, in the wilderness, God's presence uh, accompanied the people through their trials in the wilderness after they were freed from their captivity in Egypt. And uh, God's presence at that time was uh, was in the tabernacle, a tent that moved along with the people wherever they went, and was seen in a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So God's presence was there. God's glory was present with the people, residing there, dwelling among them in the tabernacle. And now John is saying, now something new has come, something is replacing, something new is replacing the old. And now the presence of God, the glory of God, is found living among us in the person of Jesus. Jesus reveals to us the glory of God. His whole life, even his death and resurrection, are the revelation of God's glory. And so God's glory is still among us, but now it's in the person of Jesus. And uh, God is choosing to dwell among us once again. And because of this, because Jesus is from above, because he has been with God and that he is God, uh, uh, that divine nature, uh, he has so much to show us and to teach us about God. He knows God better than any of us can possibly know God. And so it says, uh, he, John ends the prologue by saying, No one has seen God, but is God the only Son who is able to make him known? So Jesus comes into the world taking on human form in order for us to know this God and to enter into relationship with this God. And Jesus is the ideal one to show us who the Father is and to help us to establish that relationship. So we see in John's Gospel a carefully held balance between the divine nature of Jesus. John is absolutely clear that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God, but at the same time that Jesus is human being, that he has taken on human flesh, that he experiences human life as we do as uh, another place in the scripture says, he's tempted in every way as we are. Uh, he experiences the fullness of life. So we see a very human Jesus at some points in the gospel. We see Jesus weeping at the grave of his friend Lazarus with genuine emotion for the loss. Or we see Jesus looking to his disciples after the crowds are dispersing. They're finding what he's saying about himself more and more offensive. And he looks to his disciples and says, will you also leave? We see him being very vulnerable, very human at times. And we also see him uh, indicating his divine nature at times. At times he, he's able to perceive uh, what people are thinking or what's happening. He's understanding it at an entirely different level than what the human beings in the scene can see and appreciate and understand. So 
John holds those truths, two things in tension, uh, the divine nature of Jesus and the human nature of Jesus. He's equally committed to both. And this is where the church uh, found John's gospel so helpful as it was coming to articulate its belief in the two uh, natures of Jesus. So we have, uh, uh, we have this gospel um, and, and the prologue of this gospel indicating to us this divine being which has taken on human form to live among us. Uh, it's, uh, and John's gospel operates on these two levels, a kind of natural, earthly level, a human level, and then there are also the divine or the supernatural, the transcendent level. And sometimes uh, Jesus has uh, trouble uh, <laughs> convincing people or people are confused because they're thinking on a human level and Jesus is actually speaking about something spiritual or divine. So for example, Nicodemus thinks he needs to be, needs to go back into his mother's womb to be born again after Jesus invites him to be born anew. And Jesus is not talking about going back into his mother's womb. He's talking about a spiritual transformation in which a, a new life is born um, and a person is born anew or born again in God. And the same thing with this Samaritan woman at the well. She's, she's, uh, Jesus talks to her about living water, but he's talking about a spiritual reality. He's not talking about physical water. She says to him, well, how are you going to give me this water? The well is deep and you don't have a, a bucket. And, uh, and she's thinking on a purely um, uh, earthly plane. So very often we see these two levels interacting with one another. Uh, and the creating confusion uh, among the recipients. So here's where we're going with this. We're going to we're going to look at the gospel uh, week by week, uh, looking at various themes. John opens the gospel with this prologue, which gives us insight into who Jesus really is and what his purpose for being in the world is all about. But then uh, we see through the book of signs, we see people encountering Jesus and trying to make sense of him and trying to understand who he is. Uh, and uh, they're, they're coming either to believe in him or they're coming to reject him and we're seeing what happens to him along the way. And so next week we'll be looking at three of these encounters that Jesus has with, with three individuals and what they tell us about uh, uh, Jesus' uh, purpose for being in the world. Uh, so at the end of this session, uh, uh, where we just tried to give you an introduction, an overview uh, of where we're going, um, and to look specifically at the prologue, at the end of this section, we will be emailing you to uh, um, uh, a handout that will include a summary of some of the major points we tried to make in this first section, but will also include some suggestions for prayer for the next seven days. So you can continue to pray with some of the themes that we've raised in the opening lecture and continue to explore them on your own and to pray about them. So there are several, several uh, prayer exercises that are provided for you. You can also find these prayer exercises. They'll be posted on the internet, uh, a site called uh, Teachable. And um, if you, uh, we will send you a link to that site, the Teachable site, in which we will post these uh, documents that we're sending out to you by email. And uh, also there will be space there for you to respond and to ask questions or to dialogue with one another. So thank you again for joining us on uh, this journey, and we look forward to being with you next week.